I got to start off by saying I feel a little bit sheepish. It's not uh, the best way to start a talk with an apology, but uh, the gorilla and the giraffe I'd originally arranged to be here, uh, they won't be making it. What happened was when they were coming up over the border, the uh, crossing officer got a little bit insulted with the giraffe. He felt that he was uh, looking down on him <laughs> and uh, decided to teach them a lesson. The gorilla became enraged with injustice and he went bananas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I got some replacements from Toys R Us. Now they're not the real thing, so I need everybody in here to put on your imagination caps for the rest of my talk, okay? I'll give you a few seconds to do that. All right, are they on? Are they on? Okay, perfect. I want you to divert your attention away from the very elegant, very tall Jeffrey the Giraffe and the thousand-pound gorilla in the room, George the Gorilla. And I want you to focus on this similarity between Jeffrey, George, and Diane. And that is that we all live here. They all live here. There's a gorilla, a giraffe, and Diane that all live on this planet. Now, the difference is, and this is what I want you to focus on, the difference is that if I asked Jeffrey or George to come up on stage with me and to create a piece of art, to capture the experience that we're sharing together and the energy in the room, they wouldn't know what to do. And the reason is because Jeffrey is a giraffe and George is a gorilla. But when I asked Diane to do the same thing and I told her about my idea, she was inspired, and she knew what to do. I left home uh, to attend university after finishing high school. That was about 12 years ago, and now I'm in the last few months of my medical education to become a medical oncologist. And I can honestly say that I'm not the same person I was when I started this journey, and a tremendous amount of that has to do with my medical education. Going to the gross lab to dissect human bodies and delivering more babies than I can count on four hands, and calling four or five families in an evening to tell them their loved one has died, has without a doubt had a tremendous impact on me. And being a part of all these beginnings and endings of life stories, and being there to help sort out some of the kinks along the way, has changed how I look at life. And the way I see it, what life is, is an unfathomable number of steps and processes. They're all miraculously orchestrated to come together to create an infinite number of pictures, stories, and possibilities. And the one thing that always makes me step back a little bit is that it all occurs without any single one individual, and yet we all put a tremendous amount of energy into our own lives to pursue what it is that we think is success, whether that be our careers, building a family, relationships, pursuing a passion, or simply walking across the room to connect with someone. Even with all of my education, I can honestly say I am more in awe of what this thing is than ever before. About two years ago, I began the medical oncology portion of my training. And it seemed like there was a part during clinic, over a couple of months, where I was only seeing two kinds of patients. There was one group that was about my age, 20s and early 30s. And there was another group that was just about re to retire. And what these two groups had in common was that both were at the very beginning of a new journey in their life. The younger group were just beginning to start careers and families and to explore what it meant to be independent adults with all the possibilities that life has to offer. And the older group were finishing successful careers. Their families were becoming independent. 
And they were getting to the point where they were ready to reward themselves with a whole new set of possibilities. And they were in clinic. And they were being told that they were, had a disease that in many cases would be fatal. About six months ago, I was lying in bed. It was four in the morning. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, what if I was in their shoes? What if I was the one being diagnosed with cancer, with all the plans I have for my life ahead of me? Would I continue on with my training, knowing that my career wasn't just getting started, but that in all reality, it may be just ending? Now, we've all heard of a midlife crisis. Picture a 50-year-old gentleman, balding, portly, driving around in a foreign sports car with a sexy blonde half his age. But what about a one-third life crisis? What does that look like? Picture this, a young professional, up to his eyeballs in debt, coming to grips with the realization that life isn't a race to be won, but it is a gentle ebb and flow between beginnings and endings, a harmony between life and death, and that no amount of studying that I could ever do would ever allow me to come to full understanding of what life is. Not only that, but my ability to impact the world in a positive way was just as much in my own hands with the amount of energy that I put in, the things that I choose to, but in the hands of fate. For me, this was really something to munch on. A tiramisu of existential angst, which no amount of Tylenol or Merlot could relieve. I began to listen to a lot of emo. I considered painting my fingernails black, but I really wasn't sure how well that would go over in clinic. And then I had an idea. It came to me in a dream. Crack cocaine! <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> seriously, I'm just kidding. The, uh, what I did was I started to do a little bit of research. And I went on the internet, and I found this thing called the mortality table. And I looked on the mortality table to figure out how long am I going to be alive for? And what I found is that, on average, for someone like me, I'll probably be kicking it to about age 78. And I kind of knew that. I kind of knew that that's kind of what I was looking at. But the thing that was really cemented by looking at the mortality table was that the probability of dying in any single given year is not zero. In fact, there is a slim but real chance that I may have already had my last birthday. And with this realization, my one-third life crisis began to resolve. Let me show you how I did it, using the magical and mysterious powers of felt. OK. So the circle represents the amount of time I have to be alive. The red part represents the time that's already passed, the time that I've used up. And this represents the time to come, that I can fill with whatever I choose. Now, after having this crisis, I've definitely rearranged the ways that some of my priorities are going to be played out in this period. I've changed my goals a little bit. But I think the biggest change for me has been since coming to the realization that, statistically, every day could be my last. I've made some changes so that every day when I go to bed, I'm happy that I've made a little bit of a positive impact on the world in case I don't get to do it tomorrow. I could tell you what those things are, but this is a place for ideas, ideas about play. So here's mine. What if everybody in this room, in this province, in this country, and in this planet looked at the time they have left in their lives, not as something to race ahead into, but 
as the blank space on a pie chart. Just like I gave Diane 15 minutes to fill her canvas with whatever she could imagine, what if we looked at the blank space on our canvas as not a threat to our own well-being, being fearful of our mortality, but the key to unlocking any number of possibilities that we can fit into it however we choose. So, I realize that this idea might be a little bit out there. So, as any good physician, researcher, scientist person does, I did a survey. And I asked 166 people three questions. The first one was, what's your age? The second one was, what's your gender? And the only reason I asked those questions was because if you're going to do a survey, you just have to. <laughs> but the third question was the important one, and that was, if I could tell you when you're going to die, would you want to know and why? And the answers I got were surprising, because only one-third wanted to know. And the reasons why they wanted to know were because they wanted to plan. They wanted to plan their families, their careers, their relationships. They wanted to prioritize what they were going to do with that time. But two-thirds didn't. And the majority of the people that didn't, didn't want to know because they thought it would make their lives worse. The most common reason for not wanting to know was because people were afraid that it would make them depressed and anxious and make their lives far worse than if they didn't know. There's a psychotherapist named Irving Elom, and one of his ideas was that people put a tremendous amount of energy into the avoidance and, den and denial of their own mortality. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy is constant. It can neither be created nor destroyed. What if we could harness that energy to use however we want in our own lives? With regards depression and anxiety. Nathan Hafleck is a researcher, a research associate at the University of Kent. And he reported in Psychology Today on some work that he did where he got people to put in energy into thinking about their own mortality. He had a control group that didn't do the exercise that he assigned, and then he had the study group that did. And what he found was that Immediately after beginning to put energy into our own mortality and thinking about it and playing with it, the people were, were depressed. But then what he found is that compared to a control group, a week after the exercise began, the people were less depressed. Not only that, but they were more motivated by self-growth, relationships, and helping others. All right, are your imagination caps still on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. Just wanted to check. So, I need you all to close your eyes for a second, okay? Everyone's eyes closed? Okay, cool. When I think of the word play, my favorite definition is this. That which is freely chosen, personally directed, and intrinsically motivated. From my survey, it appears that our society may have a considerable amount of energy tied up in avoiding our own mortality. What if we could take that energy and use it for anything that we wanted? From Nathan Hafleck's work, it's suggested that when people think about their own mortality, they freely choose they're personally directed and intrinsically motivated by relationships, by self-growth, and by helping others. This is where you really got to use your imagination caps. What if this was how the whole world played? You guys can open your eyes. Okay. So I didn't bring Diane up here just because I wanted an assistant, although it has been fun. 
I brought her up here because I wanted to show to you guys how easy it is to transform energy. What Diane has done with the time that we've spent together, the energy that we've put into this talk, into the ideas, and the atmosphere in this room, has been saved in this canvas. And what we're going to do with it is we're going to take it outside and we're going to set it up for a silent auction. The proceeds are going to go to Winnipeg Harvest so that some of our energy can go towards helping fellow Winnipeggers put a little bit less energy into thinking about where their next meal is coming from and a little bit more into thinking about how to play. Thank you so much.